Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Liesl, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. So let's start with a little bit about your background. What were you doing before you got into the mission aligned investing space? Well, way, way back in the day, kind of the thing I suppose I'm, I'm the most trained to do, my background's actually in theater and in acting. Um, and if you dig around enough on the internet, you can see evidence of that from some film and, and, and theater that I did when I was much younger. But then really when I got to college, um, I went to Columbia right around the time when the Earth Institute was getting set up. And there was a lot of conversation around new forms of sustainable development and the role of international aid and kind of market-based solutions to poverty. And I kind of, I, I was studying history. I was really interested in international development and, and sort of theater and film and acting became a little bit less of a focus and less relevant. And so it's right around that time, kind of, I, I guess, like everybody else, those sort of formative years between kind of 18 to 22, 24, when I thought, hmm, this is, I, I'm, I'm interested in in these new ways that people are looking at addressing sort of systemic um, um, systemic forms of poverty, and that coupled with also being a wealth holder myself and trying to think about what my role in all of that was, and how was I contributing to sort of an, an unequal society, and what were ways that I could proactively try to steer my resources and my own intellectual capital as well towards addressing that. And so, yeah, so pivoted from a theater background into sort of managing my own wealth, both on the philanthropic side and then really more and more looking at how philanthropy and for-profit investing can work together to address some of these issues in different areas. Yeah, so, so quite, a, quite a pivot, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully it gives me some interesting perspective. <laughs> I like how you, you glossed over that you get to meet Harrison Ford when you're younger. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was very cool. That was that was fun. Awesome. Okay, so you start to move into, you know, what can I do in the world? How do I use wealth, you know, for good? You know, I'm wondering if what are sort of the the feelings when you're at that age around like, you know, there's so many things I could be doing with, you know, with sort of my time and energy and and money, how do you decide what issues to pursue when you're sort of looking at, at sort of the things to, to do when you're sort of post-college? Well, I think that, that it, that's, it, it's tricky because it can be, you know, I'm an inheritor of wealth. I didn't make this money myself. And I'm very aware of that. And so the idea that you know, that this is sort of mine to control is complicated, right? This is something that um, 
I've come into. It's been passed on to me. So you do a lot of questioning around, do I deserve this? Why me? Am I worthy of this? And as you're doing that questioning, then there's another side of you that's also saying, stop wasting time with all of this navel gazing and get on with something that's actually useful to the world because all of your soul searching is actually not helpful to anybody else. <laughs> and so um, there's there's kind of those two things that are happening at the same time. And the way that I kind of dealt with that is by trying to learn as much as I could and trying to go to places that were different than where I grew up and the, you know, sort of subset of culture that I'm from. So volunteering, traveling, reading lots of books about different people's experiences, particularly around the economics of poverty. That was something that was very interesting to me. And how do, uh, whether it's philanthropists or international development agencies, um, look at that today and historically. Lots of people have tried lots of different things. And I'm not necessarily trying to disrupt anything or do something new. I really want to learn from people who've had experience. So both gaining that experience directly myself by, as I said, volunteering or traveling and then joining networks of people who have more experience than I had. Those were really the ways and, and going slow, learning and starting to, you know, enter the world of philanthropy as a donor, starting to go to other conferences with donors. It was also kind of right around this time that impact investing was taking off. And so I was able to leverage some of those resources as they were getting developed as well and join in those conversations. So gain experience yourself, I would say, read as much as you can and be a joiner. <laughs> yeah. What, what were some of the, where did you travel that sort of opened your eyes to the sort of, wow, it's not like Kansas anymore. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, well, it all feels very sort of, uh, you know, recounting the stories all feels quite, you know, stereotypical, right? I was in college. There was a volunteer placement agency that sort of came to, to, to the college campus and I was, and, and they were placing volunteers in all in lots of different places. And I chose India. And so, uh, I was in a town in Northern India for a summer volunteering at a daycare center, which of course I have absolutely no qualification to do. I'm not a, you know, mother of a two and a half year old. I still feel unqualified. Um, <laughs> but, uh, what was really great about that experience was just, you know, you're thrown into a situation where it's just pure direct service. There's nothing highfalutin. You are not solving some structural issue around the economics of this community. You are just there to watch the kids and to make sure they don't burn themselves on the gas stove. And, and hopefully, you know, do some counting and playing and identifying of, of animals and, um, and exploration, which is what I did. And that was a lot of fun and also just very humbling and very, you know, you sort of connect with, you're halfway around the world. You're from a totally different sort of socioeconomic place than, than these kids that you're with. And yet, you know, everybody's got to learn how to potty train. Everybody's, got to have some lunch. There's a very, very basic things that connect us all. And as cliche as that sounds, that experience does, I think, sort of help and ground, ground me as I think about, you know, the work that I'm doing today. So that was one experience. And then I also volunteered at a very small microfinance institution in Tanzania. After that, it was really a credit cooperative just north of Dar es Salaam. And that was that was very interesting as well. It was a group of 92 women who had a, a SACO group, so a savings and credit cooperative organization, um, which is which is fairly typical in that part of the world. And my job was to help put the sort of loan documents onto a brand new computer that had just been donated um, by an aid organization. And so I was doing data entry for this MFI for also for a summer. Um, and so... Two very different jobs, but I think I think very useful to do when you're when you're young and trying to figure out what the hell you want to do. I would say what you did is not very cliche. I think the cliche thing would be more of like I took a summer and I traveled through like Scotland and England and France and I saw you know. <laughs> but you were like in a daycare in India and in Tanzania, so I think you get plus plus points for those. Two. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Okay. I don't know. I feel very, I don't know, rich kid goes volunteering in India. I just, you know, I want to be aware sometimes of 
of, of my own cliches, but I learned a lot. So to me, it was, it was useful. And so let's, so maybe this is around like mid 2000s. So when did you start to think about Blue Haven and like, when did the actual investing piece start to come up for you in the philanthropic piece? So, so a lot of this kind of happened sort of slowly, but simultaneously. So I was having these experiences. I was volunteering. I particularly became involved as a donor to a microfinance organization called Opportunity International. And they're a big network of, of microfinance organizations all throughout the world. And they have all kinds of different financial services and insurance products and savings. And I became a donor to them and got really interested in how they were monitoring their social impact and developing new products and services and also taking advantage of you know, this was in the mid 2000s. So new technologies like, you know, the proliferation of mobile phones and mobile banking and M-Pesa and, and how that was affecting sort of traditional bricks and mortar microfinance. And so as I was learning about all of these things, really as a donor, I started realizing that there was a growing disconnection between what I was interested in on the philanthropic side and what was happening in my investment portfolio. So on the one hand, I'm spending all of my time and my energy and my excitement and passion learning about, you know, digital financial services. And then actually my, the bulk of my assets were invested in a way that had no connection whatsoever to that impact or passion that I was seeing. And financial services, generally speaking, I'm oversimplifying here in the case of, of microfinance, but it, it's investable. Um, it, it's actually, you know, a large part of the investable economy is investing in microfinance, uh, in, in, in financial services. And so I started to ask questions to my investment advisors around, well, you know, I know that there are microfinance investment vehicles out there. I know that there are funds that support these banks, not specifically opportunity banks. I'm interested in, but just generally the field at large, are there ways in with my investment portfolio? And could we take a look at that? Because I really think there's big impact to be had. And again, so mid 2000s, this was not so popular. And at that time, a lot of financial advisors and intermediaries didn't quite know what to do with clients like me that would come to them and say, I'd like to find some financial products in my investment portfolio that have social or environmental impact. And there, there wasn't a whole lot of information about how to, how to actually execute a portfolio like that or find investments like that. And so that was kind of that frustration really started me further on this path of, of impact investing and trying to find other investors who also had hit these issues and how had they solved these problems? How had they looked for investments, whether direct investments or through other asset classes where they could both sort of satisfy their need for social impact, but also be, be prudent stewards of, of the resources that they were, that they were given or, or investing. Cause that's something, as I mentioned earlier, the psychology of an inheritor can be tricky. I, I, I personally don't feel that it would be an option for me to just give all my money away. I think, you know, I'm a steward for the next generation. And so it's really important to me to maintain that base for the next generation so that they have choices that, that I had. But at the same time, I want to do, I, I want the impact of this capital to be as high as I possibly can make it. And so, so that, that kind of started me on this journey, but it started with realizing where I was spending my time had no overlap to what my investment dollars were doing. And I wanted to have a little bit more cohesion between those two sides of, of, of my life. Yeah. Some of the other folks we've had on this podcast who are wealth holders have said, you don't just inherit money. You also inherit, say, your parents, financial advisor and sort of mm -hmm. folks who are maybe like play they're like golf buddies. And so it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's a lot more difficult to actually move your money out of the systems that it's been inside of. I don't know if that yeah. Is. There's, um, there is, there's, there's a sort of a, a cultural piece behind it too, in that way of, of, you know, you have, you have a set of advisors who are by all accounts doing a good job. You're just asking for something that is not really currently in their job description. And so it takes a long time 
and a lot of convincing to sort of say, no, actually, this is going to be better for the long term. Let's explore this together. And so that dynamic between sort of client and financial advisor um, is a tricky one that I think the field is still sort of wrestling with as it grows. But I've, I've learned a lot in that regard around, you know, I think that the intermediaries are really, they, I think a lot of them are trying to do their best. They're trying to catch up with clients who are moving a little quicker. And that's a little scary. I think it's us millennials, maybe, or those of us on the border of the millennial, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, completely. Yeah. And and that's the other thing. Like, I read all the, you know, the PwC and Deloitte studies of like, you know, female millennial investors. And I'm like, total bullseye in the middle of all of those studies. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Again, back to those cliches. <laughs> and so it sounds like you couldn't maybe find invest investment or you had investment advisors. They were maybe open to it, but didn't move as quickly. And so did you say, okay, I'll sort of start Blue Haven, like I'll start my own investment uh, advisor it's myself? Or how did that kind of process work? Well, no. So we, we still do work with external advisors. We didn't build our own advisory service. Well, because as I, as I said, my background is in theater. And so, um, <laughs> uh, I need, I need people that are much smarter and more experienced than I am to, to rely on for, you know, modeling your ideal asset allocation and, um, you know, best practices and due diligence and things like that. So, um, and I'm very grateful for all of those intermediaries and we've worked with a number of them over the years. But really the, the reformulating of my own single family office that now I run with my husband happened around actually the time that we got married. And it was an effort to bring the work that he has been doing on the philanthropy side, I've been doing on the philanthropy side and where we wanted to take the investment work and bring it under one strategy and sort of say, you know what? We have all of these resources as a family office. We have both investment capital, we have philanthropic capital, and then we have our voices and our time. We have all of these different kinds of resources. Let's bring them under one roof, call it one name, hire people to help us accomplish this mission of total portfolio activation for, for impact. And we think it's going to be easier to tell that story if it's sort of under one organization. And that was why that was kind of where the idea for calling it Blue Haven Initiative and putting this work out there, getting a website. A lot of family offices don't have a website. We sort of wanted to, to, to be transparent and also be a resource for other investors or family offices that are curious about this kind of investing. That was one of the things that I really yearned for when I was starting to do this was where are other people that I can talk to who've done this before? And there definitely were a few, and I'm deeply grateful to them, like Charlie and Lisa Kleisner, Pierre and Pam Omidyar. Um, you know, there's there are some out there, and there's more and more. But um, that transparency piece was was really important to helping me understand what I wanted to do, and so we wanted to do the same. And you know, what are some of the things that you're doing, or what are you most excited about with the with the work you're doing at Blue Haven? So, kind of the the work that we're doing falls under. A, a few different categories. I'd say in the, the broader investment portfolio where we're working across asset classes to try to find really great funds and managers that have impactful and values aligned strategies uh, really across all of the asset classes. So those look different depending on what part of the portfolio you're in, whether it's, you know, positively screened public equities, or, you know, a strategy that is finding high yield municipal bonds in distressed municipalities where there's scarcity of capital. There's a lot of really interesting things that can happen in some of these asset classes that get a lot of a lot less airtime than, say, your direct investment portfolio. So I, I'm excited about sort of the work that we're doing and finding products and investments in that space. Then we also spend a lot of our time on our direct investment portfolio. So we have a $50 million allocation to early and growth stage companies in sub-Saharan Africa that have either a fintech or renewable energy focus. Often they have both. <laughs> Those two sectors seem to be merging in an interesting way. And so uh, we provide sort of early stage equity, mostly equity, some debt to those companies and that we run in-house um, and we have a team that's dedicated to that. 
and then also, you know, our grant work, some of which supports our investment work in terms of we fund research into impact investing. So one constant gripe that I hear about the impact investing space is that there's not enough information. CIOs don't feel convinced around um, claims of financial return. There are a lot of perception issues. And so we help to fund research to shed some light on actually what are the returns in the impact space um, and over what period of time. Then we also do some grant work around organizing networks of investors. And this may be also slightly self-serving, but as I said, um, one of the ways that I learn the best is by learning from peers. And so how can we assemble groups of investors and strengthen that sort of infrastructure in the impact investing space as well? Um, and bring other kinds of capital into the space. And so we support that with our, with our grants and looking to do a little bit more grant work related to some of the sector specific issues that our investment portfolio brings up. So more kind of financial services and, and renewable energy as well. So that's a lot of different things. <laughs> um, but what I get really excited about is when I see the synergies between our grant portfolio and our investment portfolio. And we can use different kinds of capital across the spectrum to look at, to look at one problem. And we're in a really luxurious position as a fairly lean single family office to do that. We don't have to go through, you know, six months of investment committee meetings to approve one grant. And so we try to take advantage of that nimbleness when we're looking at, at, at certain problems. Yeah. It looks like yeah. you're involved in. One of my favorite organizations, B-Lab, and it looks like you uh, made a grant to them. Can you tell us a little bit, what's the backstory of your involvement with B-Lab? We did. We did. We love B-Lab. Um, they are wonderful. We gave B-Lab a grant over a few years that was in support of their fellows program. So this was a program that they did to place fellows for two years with and help sort of local companies, in this case, it was in the city of New York, help local companies go through the sort of B-Lab assessment, not certification process, but really just the best practices and sort of moving your company up uh, the kind of the, the, the B-Lab model. Um, and so they were sort of consulting with local businesses to help them get better using the B-Lab framework. And this was kind of a pilot program done with the city of New York. It was part of their best for New York campaign to, and it was kind of really fun. They had different like chambers of commerce within the city kind of compete who, which businesses were the best for New York and kind of fueling a lot of this energy behind it were these B-Lab fellows that were placed to, to, to help these businesses improve and, and come up with plans to have better employee engagement and community engagement through these programs. And then there were winners at the end and it was, and it was really exciting. And now that model, other cities are really interested in, um, in bringing that to other, in, um, to their cities as well. So it was a pilot to see, you know, can almost looking at sustainable business development as a community service, I guess would be how I describe it. And so we were really excited to, to partner with B-Lab on that one. Awesome. Yeah I, yeah, I did a training for the fellows before they left um, to New York around like certification. That's oh, cool. part of my yeah. day job is uh, helping companies certify. So that's great. Well, I, didn't know you, I didn't know you were part of the, the sort of support for that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a cool, that was a really cool program. Cool. Let's dive in a little bit more to that, the, the direct investment piece, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, because I think that's really interesting. I mean, I think many of the listeners on the podcast are, you know, they're, they're maybe aware of you know, sort of like public mutual, you know, mutual funds that are more socially socially responsible screens. But I think there's maybe some of the listeners are more interested on the what are the direct investments and how do you sort of how do you decide which companies invest in and how do you do due diligence in sub-Saharan Africa? <laughs> and hmm. could you speak a little bit around, you know, this renewable energy and fintech and what you're seeing in sub-Saharan Africa and sort of the maybe some of the companies that you're investing in down there? Sure. So our direct investment portfolio, as I said, so it's a, it's a $50 million allocation, Evergreen Fund, because again, it, it's just internally within our own family office. And it's run by our amazing private investment team. 
that's headed by Lauren Cochran. And the mandate there and, and the strategy is to look for businesses. And this, this is, it sounds like a very broad mandate, but really look for businesses that are, that are serving underserved communities or populations. And in sub-Saharan Africa, that can mean a lot of different things. In the case of Umadi Capital, which is one of our investees, they are an agricultural supply chain finance company. So they do essentially invoice discounting for processors of agricultural products or distributors of agricultural products. So say like a, a cashew nut processing facility that has an order placed by, say, a grocery store chain or by an exporter, but obviously can't they're not going to get paid till they deliver the product, but they have to pay the farmers. So there's a big gap in the supply chain finance for companies like this. And it's very difficult for them to get funding. So, you know, these are small businesses that can't get access to capital. So in our view, that is an underserved community that is really part of the plumbing of an entire economic system. And if they don't get paid, the farmers don't get paid. So, that's one company on the on this financial services and fintech side that has come up with with a good way to service those kinds of clients. So that's one company that's in the portfolio. And then on the on the energy side, another one is MCOPA that a number of people know. Um, they are the leading pay as you go solar home system company. Um, they're based in Kenya, but they serve East Africa more broadly and are expanding fairly quickly. So they sell and finance solar home systems of different sizes and televisions as well. They've added to the product mix. And there's an interesting, you know, this is one of these companies that sort of is both um, providing access to renewable energy, but also just as importantly, access to finance. So for a number of the families they work with, this is the most robust credit history that they've been able to accumulate. And that has knock on effects with other ways that they can access capital. And so we like both of those parts of the business as they're growing. And MCOPE has been one that's also been able to attract a fair amount of sort of commercial scale capital as well as, as they've expanded. So really taking it beyond social enterprise space and into a, a fast growing company, one of the fastest growing companies on the continent, according to The Economist. Yeah, so... So that's exciting. And, um, and they've really, they've, they've done an incredible job in that market. Yeah. And I love that that's, for me, that that feels like impact, you know, when we talk about impact investing, you know, there, there also are wise financial advisors who, you know, want us to have be invested in municipal bonds and other things, but it always seems like, but there's so many cool startup that are really addressing challenges, but I don't know. <laughs> well, and then though, so I, I definitely agree. And, you know, I love, I, I love spending time with these companies as well because they do what they're doing and what they do every day and the decisions that they're facing are, are really exciting. And also as an early stage investor, you feel very connected to what that capital is doing and less so than you would for, you know, yeah, a municipal bond fund. But at the same time, even that, like there are even some impact investors that say, no, and COPE is not going down market enough. Like, they're serving, you know, the clients that they're serving are are not the poorest of the poor and they should be going further down market. So you're really, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So <laughs> that's been my experience on that front. Yvonne Schoenard said, uh, living the examined life is a pain in the ass because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because exactly. it's like, well, you can see why so many folks who have means, it's like, there's a tendency sometimes to just be like, um going to focus over here because it's almost too hard to figure out. And so I just want to you know, appreciate you and like the work you're doing with your peers around like, no, we have to, like, this is hard and yet it still needs to happen. Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And, and from our standpoint, also, I think we, we, we're, we're kind of lucky in that we're doing this from, from a portfolio standpoint. So we've got different parts of the portfolio that can do different kinds of things. And so if you only have grant capital, then you're only going to, you know, your threshold for what is an underserved community might be a bit different and your parameters for what you can grant to are more limited. And so I think there's room for all of these different kinds of investments within 
a single portfolio. And actually, I think it makes the portfolio stronger because it's more diversified and you're using different kinds of tools. And so, you know, a a solution or an impactful solution in your municipal bond portfolio is going to look really different than an impactful solution in your direct investment portfolio. And I think we should celebrate that instead of trying to make everything sort of look the same or, or fit into one person's definition of what impact is. But there's constantly, you know, there's, there's lots of people that have fixed opinions about what impact investing should be. So, and fair enough. Yeah, fair enough, right? Yeah. Who are some of the most cutting edge impact investors or philanthropists in your, like, who do you look to to, to get inspiration for in this space? I have always loved and look to the work that Omidyar Network does, both their leaders and Pierre and Pam Omidyar, but also just their team is like a rock star. And I, I really love the conversations and the partnerships that I've had with them. And I've learned a lot from that team and very grateful for their guidance as, as we've been setting up because they also have a hybrid structure of you know, can do some grants, can do some concessionary investments, can do some for-profit investments. And we've, what I particularly like about their approach is that the tool changes, but the thoughtfulness doesn't. And that's something that I, I, I would, would love to keep constant in our work as well. So I would definitely put them up there as, as big inspiration. Gosh, and there are a lot, there are there are lots of others, but the one that's coming to me at the moment. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I might have to to do put, to have them on the podcast because I know generally about some of their work. I know Pam's involved in some really cool stuff, but um, yeah. So maybe at yeah. some point, I'll, yeah. What do you see as some? Is there like one rule or thing that mindset shift around impact investing that could help flow more capital into the space? Is there something you see people get constantly hung up on, or is there you know what, what comes to mind when you hear that question? So I'd say sort of from two perspectives, I think that there is some barriers to entry for new entrants into the impact space. So, you know, people who are traditional investors that are either impact curious or kind of naysayers are sitting on the sidelines. I think that there's a perception issue around, you know, that you you absolutely must give up returns in order to be considered an impact investor. Or that you have to have a perfect framework for impact management and measurement in order to enter the space. So I think that there's a, there's a perception issue that is keeping some new capital on the sidelines. Some of that I think is, uh, is, is, is false or is truly just a perception issue. And then some of that I think is proliferated by impact investors themselves. Again, you know, talking about some of the naysayers or, or people saying that, you know, this, in, this investment isn't sort of good enough, um, or we can't measure its impact perfectly. So therefore it shouldn't be considered an impact investment or investors who are going for market rate returns are not real impact investors. And, you know, they're doing a disservice to the space. There's some infighting currently going on in the impact investing space that, you know, I think healthy debate that ups everyone's game is is useful but uh i'm pretty pragmatic about at least my investment decision making and i also am impatient in that front so i want to i want to put my capital to work now with the tools that are available to me and i want to get better over time and if i sit and nitpick at every single investment and why it's not perfect I don't think that does anybody any help. Certainly not the stakeholders or the constituents that you're trying to help with that investment. So again, back to this sort of navel gazing, I, I can only stomach so much of that. <laughs> so I'd say some of the barriers to entry are just perception issues from people who need to do a little bit more research about the space. And some of them are, are being proliferated from, from our own ranks. Like I'm, uh, I'm a hundred percent impact investor, or I'm, you know, I'm in, only in regenerative, local living. Yeah, I understand. And that's yeah. and the thing is, is that like God bless, that's great. Like and and people have different areas of focus and different theories of change, and that is terrific. That is helpful and wonderful, and you know, and I learn a lot from that. There's there are 
incredibly impactful ways to invest in, in a deeply locally rooted economy. And I am, I am very grateful for those investors who know how to do that and are taking a thoughtful approach to that. But I think that we can appreciate that about different people's investment styles without taking down someone else's theory of change necessarily. I think I really swear to God, I think there's room in the world for these different kinds of approaches to take place. And I don't think that that waters down the impact of one theory of change over another. I really think that there's space for both. I think someone said on one of my podcasts, there's like 200 and 20 trillion assets under management in the world. And so impact investing is still a couple trillion. So I do agree that whatever slice of impact is is helping that larger 220 trillion slice because we're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> have, have, right. you, have you heard of um, the book Drawdown by Paul Hawken? No. So it's interesting because he actually looks at the top 100 solutions to climate change and ranks them by... It's the first time it's ever been done, but it, he actually looks at you know, if you did solar and if you did wind and you put them head to head, which would actually be more effective and in terms of gigatons of carbon reduced and also sort of, oh. um, and also in terms of cost savings. And uh-huh. it's really interesting because he, he ranks the top 100 and a lot of the things like electric cars aren't as high, but like wind power, onshore wind power or offshore wind power is, I think, second. And things like educating girls is actually number six because, in de- there- as you know, in the developing world, If you don't have, I think it's, if you lose out on 12 years of education, like you don't go to school, you're more likely to have five, like five kids, I think. So on this, on this point though, (laughs) so there, there are really, there are good ways to spin this. And then there are controversial ways to spin this as well. There was, and again, I I, don't totally quote me on this, but there was, I saw a couple years ago, maybe based on the same research, but the economist published a chart of, yeah, effective, what, what have been some of the most effective policies that have been passed that have reduced um, carbon that would have entered the environment and then sort of didn't. And the number one was the passing of the Montreal Protocol around sort of air conditioners and emissions around around that. That was number one. Do you know what number two was? China one child policy. Wow. So um, yeah, that that had that not happened, carbon emissions would be considerably higher than they are today. And that's a li- that is the the controversial angle of, of what you were just saying around educating girls actually reduces reduces fertility rates, which does affect carbon. One is by choice, however, and one is forced. And so that's clear. But um, there, are, there, there, can, <laughs> there can be some controversial. I'm telling you, bring that up at a climate change cocktail party and talk about a conversation. <laughs> some grasshoppers come out. Trip, oh trip. my God, exactly. Right. Liesl's in favor of the one child policy. I'm, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me make that extremely abundantly clear. I'm just saying that, you know, um, effectiveness and, uh, morality don't always go hand in hand. <laughs> that is very, that's the first time I've heard that. That's a great, I'm gonna have to bring that back to my business partner because he worked on the drawdown project. We'll see. I know. I, it's the best the first, I I need to find exactly the source of that graph um but it was that I I remember it was in the economist um and I read that and was like oh gee <laughs> that's not all sunshine and rainbows when we're talking about climate change solutions what about books is there a particular book that you most often give as a gift ooh no there isn't that's a, sorry a, a very clear but unsatisfying answer um i um, I mean, there are a number of different books that I, I mean, that I look to and draw inspiration from. I'd probably say that, that the, the ones that I, I tend to gravitate to are sort of the development economist books. So anything by Bill Easterly, the tyranny of experts, I think was really interesting. So going into a little bit of the history of international development and consulting around that and where things have gone awry. I really, really, have been inspired by um, Jonathan Mordick's work, the development economist at NYU. And he did both internationally. And then they just recently published uh, a U.S. sort of version of this, of very intimately following sort of daily transactions of a sample of families. So 
over the course of a few years, really, truly, what does daily cash flow look like for these families? And so it's, it's not always um, the work they did internationally. You know, you hear in development speak, oh, you know, this group that lives on less than $2 a day. And it implies that there's actually some type of stability to that, that, that $2 is coming to them every day. And that's not the case at all. <laughs> and so if you're designing solutions as if somebody has constant cash flow versus someone that gets cash flow in seasonally, maybe because they're a farmer, those solutions look very different and the problems look very different. And so I really like reading their work because it ties in very closely to if we're trying to fund or finance solutions and financial services, we have to understand the cash flow of the end user. So I like that work as well. That's on the wonkier side, but other than that, I like, I like a good murder mystery, you know. <laughs> <laughs> which Sorry. book Which book is your two and a half year old most excited about right now? Oh, God. She loves, you know what she really loves? There's a uh, book called Dragons Love Tacos. Wow, I haven't, I'm going to have to get that one now. I don't oh, it's pretty great. Um, it's, uh, it, it, as advertised, it's about the fact that dragons really like tacos and they like throwing taco parties, uh, but they do not like spicy salsa. So you have to get the book to find out what happens when dragons have spicy salsa. Oh my um, gosh, that's great. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I would say most of most of my reading is uh, in the in the children's category at this point. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's see. In the last few questions here, what do you need right now? Because one of the things we af we often ask guests is how can the listeners help you grow the next economy? So, is there any sort of requests for support or think ways that people can get involved or anything in, in the work you're doing? Well, I would say, you know, for, for all of the listeners and really regardless of, of your own financial position, you don't have to be running a family office, but if you've got a 401k, ask, you know, the organization that is running that, what kinds of impact products they have available. Demonstrating demand in this space is a really, really powerful tool. And the more demand that's demonstrated, the better retail products will become available and ask them how they're measuring the impact. Is it just screening? Is it just who's really running that? And that does start to trickle up. And we are seeing that some of those service providers are, are trying to figure out this impact space and are worried about losing clients if they don't. And so I would urge people to continue to demonstrate that demand by asking questions of their advisors or, or providers. That would be probably the most immediate, the most immediate ask. Awesome. And it's very actionable too, because I know a lot of folks are really thinking about this, especially with recent world events that we don't, we don't have time to go into, but just, um, <laughs> but yeah. And, and then the, the other thing I would say is, is for, for the, the, uh, niche listener that is, uh, either a, a family office or, um, running a large family business to, Join the Impact, which is a new organization that is supporting family offices and family businesses that want to move into impact investing. So family offices and family businesses and high net worth individuals, I think, are, are, are being helpful with their philanthropy. And that's terrific. We're also trying to ask what's happening on the other side of the balance sheet. And shouldn't wealth holders also be accountable for the impact of their investments? And so this is a network of family offices that want to up their game on the investing side. So I would encourage those people to go to the impact.org to find out more. Great. And then what's the website for Blue Haven? It is bluehaveninitiative.com. All right. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Liesl. It's been a pleasure talking. I'm, I now have a great children's book on my mind. Next Economy Now is a production of Lift Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.